It's episode seven, and it is the balancing act. Hello, everybody. You're here with a Mispa, a Pseudo, and hi, a Gazamoff. Hello there. Looking very nice there, Gazamoff, on your new camera. Yes. <laughs> yes. Completely new setup. On with onwards, new sound. and can ever. Edit. Onwards and ever onwards in the pursuit of making this run a little bit more smoothly. Um, we should have good audio, good video. Everything should be playing nicely. Indeed, those of you in the chat can tell us if anything goes amiss. Um, but it is going to be uh, an interesting show. It's going to be a little bit of a balancing act. But we'll come back to that in a moment. Because before I step my way uh, via the trapeze onto the high wire and try and navigate tonight's topic... Shall we start with a little bit of news? And to kick off with news, who better than the news hound himself? It's Gazimov. Okay. We still so, need music for you. Something... Yeah, yeah something like Sorry. a cat purring, but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, kicking off today, uh, there's news that Grand Theft Auto Online, which is the MMO version of Grand Theft Auto V, the... It's been plagued with problems recently. Disconnects, characters going miss missing, all those kind of things that you expect from an MMO launch, apart from the characters going missing parts. That's kind of a big no-no. Has that ever happened before? Players. Well, it's not happened before in an MMO that I remember myself. Um, so to compensate players for the time that they've invested, Rockstar have made the unusual step of giving characters $250,000 each. So this isn't real money, this is in-game currency. Aww. <laughs> and they're going to give them that twice over. So you get one lot of 250000 initially and then another batch sometime in the future. It's a bit of a shame because that's about the only way that they can reward gamers in this um, in Grand Theft Auto Online mm. for taking part or compensating them for taking part rather. There doesn't seem to be any other way that they could have given something back to the players. And that's a bit of a shame because this is going to have some interesting impacts on the economy. I've not got into the game myself, so I'm not sure just how devastating this is likely to be, but expect the markets to be flooded with currency, at least in the short term. We'll see what kind of impact it has, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out for Rockstar. Mm -hmm. I can't see that working out well, particularly uh, for people who rely on markets to play their game. So so just talking economics 101, just for mm -hmm. a moment, Gasmoth, and to interject as we like to do on the, these news bits and bobs, yeah. isn't that a null event? If every single player gets, you know, 100,000 widgets to spend, surely mm -hmm. nobody's got any extra widgets. The relative value of everything just shifts. It becomes worthless. Well, it does to a certain extent. Sorry. To point out, Screenager says the most expensive flat is 400 k and mm -hmm. the total recompense is 500 k And he's right, it is in two deposits. We're in two deposits of 250 k each. They're trying to spread yeah. it out. They've specifically said they're not giving the exact dates as to when this is going to happen. Yeah. But it is going to occur to try to help prevent the overflooding of the market. But reality here, yeah. you know... I mean, the basic issue is that because a lot of stuff is provided by NPCs and uh, you just select an item from a list from what you want to buy, it just means that people are going to be able to buy that uh, easy or that hard to reach thing much, much easier now. So the most expensive flat, most expensive vehicle, stuff like that, it's now much more easily within players' grasps. Now, not a game I know, but is there a crafter base in the game? I, I will ass I'm assuming there is. Is that a false assumption? To be honest, I couldn't tell you. I've, 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 I've my experience with GTA is my husband's playing it, and he turns to me, um, "What mask should I buy? Should I buy the ape mask? Should I buy the gray skull <laughs> mask? Which mask?" That's about the extent of my experience with GTA yeah. right now. I did play it a little bit, and people are going to be really shocked by this, but I was actually bored by it. Um, but I couldn't tell you about crafting or anything else like that. Yeah. So if, if I were a crafter, if they do exist, I would just be planning my creating 50 things that happen to sell for the sum of money people are getting as you know yeah. one of these tranche deposits. So we'll have well, to keep a, an eye on that and see what happens. Although Ico yeah. is saying uh, in the chat there's not much of a crafter base, I guess. No, no there isn't. Uh, and that wouldn't it's surprise sort of... me. 
I mean, most of the online um, application is getting together, doing some of the quests that are given to you, or just running around with other people and killing things. It's more a matter of finding your gratification through Destruction Mayhem, which is pretty much the GTA, you know, franchise, let's be honest. Um, but, yeah, you're not going to find people sitting there going, I'm going to build the best gun. No. You walk into an airport and you steal the plane and fly. Go. Yeah, that's you know what you're looking at for the game. It's not so much an MMO, so much as a shared online violent experience together. Yeah, and I think that's a good way of putting it. So, I, I think that it just means for players that the stuff that they were going to save up for, the stuff that they were going to uh, possibly prioritize, that they've suddenly got easy access to funds so they can make that big purchase. So, um, I think it's going to be interesting, like I said, to see how it plays out. Bearing in mind, I think GTA Online is basically uh, their ploy for trying to keep people from trading in the game and taking it back and, uh, and preventing resale and stuff like that. We'll now, see, that's say. an entirely different discussion to get into because in today's day and age, once you've installed a game on something and locked your key to a particular console, mm. trying to trade a game in is not as easy as it used to be. Exactly, exactly. So that's a topic unto itself. Yes. <laughs> Moving on from GTA Online uh, ever so slightly um, to basically test the season for Halloween updates. So we've already seen with Guild Wars 2 that their Blood and Madness update is going live tomorrow and that contains all manner of bits and pieces, jumping puzzles and what have you uh, for those people who want to get in the spirit of things. There's also going to be a Rift Autumn update planned which I believe goes live tomorrow as well. And there's one for World of Warcraft, which we we kind of used to the Headless Horseman thing, which is due to go live on the 18th. So if you are interested in those kind of things and you doing the usual kind of getting all of the things like the pets and the costumes and the items and what have you, then starting from tomorrow, you'll be able to get into your favorite MMO and do those kind of bits and pieces. I think they're always kind of good, these uh, holiday events, and I'm glad that they're spread out throughout the year. Um, it's just trying to make them different every time. And I think that's slightly one of the problems with World of Warcraft is that the events are, although they're familiar, they're getting a bit repetitive. Uh, Guild Wars 2, it's going to be interesting to see how they, um, how they cope with uh, that. By all accounts, they're mixing things up slightly with their um, uh, Halloween event this year, but it's going to be interesting to see just how different it is to last year's event. Repetitor also points out that Final Fantasy XIV has uh, a Halloween thing. I think you can kind of guarantee that any MMO worth mm. its salt has some we'll kind of something. seasonal thing to hit the, the stuff. But I have to kind of agree with you. I still remember running the Headless Horseman, and I think I've got a video of it from way back in the day of doing it repetitively. It got to the point where everybody on vent was repeating the Headless Horseman's phrase, da 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 and they're just like, oh my god, shut up yeah. and just spawn so I can kill you. Yeah. But there's actually yeah. a point I remember here. doing that grind again and again just to get a uh, particular, uh, I think it was weapons that the Headless Horseman, Horseman dropped, yeah. oh, and the permanent broom as well, yeah. which never oh. dropped for me. No. The, there's an interesting point here with repetition, though, because of the wider meta. I think it's what a long, strange trip it's been, yeah. um, where you get the Violet Proto Drake, I think, for doing all yep. of them over the year, ten of them. Um, how much can they change them without changing the rules of the game? Well, they so can always change them by you, making You cheapen events. the achievement. Well, well, not necessarily they... cheapen it. You, you make it slightly different, but also you can... They, they also have the flexibility to... Uh, add and remove stuff from that meta. So if they want to bring in new events and uh, take out old events, then they're, they're quite within their rights to do that. Mm. Um, there's some Explorer achievements which have done that as they've added new continents. Yep. Uh, I, there new were Master. initially achievements for exploring Kalimdor and Eastern Kingdoms. Now there are achievements, those same achievements, you have to go around each individual region to do that. So metas there's, there's do change over time. They, they do change, but they also cheapen the experience of those who went through it. I mean, we'll get into this a little later, but one of my guild members has the tabard with the exclamation point and wow lore for the original lore master before yep. they changed it. And yet they still don't have the lore master achievement. Mm -hmm. 
because they've modified it. So in a way, it does sort of cheapen the experiences that people have been through. There's yeah. possibly an easy fix, though. I mean, all they would need to do for me when ch something like um, War Master that needs to change as the game evolves because it needs to capture the breadth of the game by definition. Um, but why don't mm. they just simply change the border on the tabard or something simple to actually go, yeah, but I've got this version or that version? Um, would be a simple solution in my mind. Mm -hmm. I think that's possible, but. Uh it's one of those things. Do you want to have a carrot that people can constantly try and aim for, or do you want to change the carrot on a regular basis? And both of those are difficult things and have different impacts on player engagement. I yeah. think that's. I think player engagement is one of those key things for that uh, Blizzard are trying desperately to keep an eye on with World of Warcraft being the age that it is. Yeah. Trying to make sure that you're providing both rewards for existing players that still want to attain something, but over a long period of time and keep adding new rewards for um, for veteran players who've already got everything. Yeah. That's oh. a difficult but kind of balancing act to do. And what value I, new I so, carrots? Yeah, yeah I, I so want to say something, but I know I just need to keep my mouth shut till we get to the meat of the show, because in all honesty, that is where I'm going to lead us. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Go ahead, gassy news. <laughs> no worries. So next up, Wildstar has released another Wednesday update. This one was referring to social tools, particularly cross-realm bits and pieces. Now, Sudo, I know this is quite passionate to uh, It's a passionate topic that you have. Ooh, so what yes. Wildstar have, have done is they said, first of all, they're going to allow cross-server communication, uh, cross-realm communication completely. So you can whisper someone else, you can message someone else, you can invite them to join your group and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You'll also be able to do any kind of instance content as far as we gather. I'm not too sure about raids, but I, from what I understand, you'd be able to do virtually anything else that's instanced with other people from other servers. You won't, however, be able to do open world content with other people from other realms because they don't have the ability to support that at the moment. This, however, does, there's quite an interesting thing. They are adding a looking for group tool, which will cross match you with other realms, but you can and specifically state that you only want to play with people from your own realm. If, you, if that's what you prefer, to try and get that bit of server community going. So if that's your preference, then that's not a problem. Um, I know, Sudo, that it's something that you've kind of <laughs> felt strongly about in the past, in terms of uh, only to in the past. That server community. So well, see, that's, that's the thing. I mean, I appreciate that in today's day and age, you need to have the bells and whistles, mm -hmm. or you're not really considered a marketing or marketable or have a share in the market. My concern really comes from the fact that if you have friends who are kind of goofing off on another server, there's nothing wrong with hanging out together, there's nothing wrong with doing instances together, but you're fostering not the server community, but the Wildstar community, which I don't necessarily think I have a problem with because of the way the Wildstar community is right now. So let, let me point that point just forward on the back. Unfortunately, the WoW community, because they're the ones who I really first saw this int uh, happening in, seems to be incredibly antagonistic towards each other. So all they were doing was just fostering the antagonistic attitudes and areas, which really made the cross thing not work right. So Wildstar has a chance to do it right, but they also have a chance to screw it up royally. To be fair, though, it's also on the people who get involved. I mean, trolls be trolls. It doesn't make a difference yeah. what game they you're playing. The community but needs to be self-policing, surely. It, it, it does need to be. But unfortunately, uh, again, I just want to say something, but it just leads us right, right into it. our main topic, <laughs> so I kind of have to wait. Yeah. So, I hope, I, I just hope, and I am literally begging the people from Carbine, please, 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 with this stuff, don't look at actually doing integration beyond what you've done. Don't take it that next step further. Do not degrade the communities of the individual servers, unless your intent is to just have one server like Eve. Mm -hmm. fine. I think one of the other things which came out of the uh, post as well was regarding the economy. Rather than having mm. two separate auction houses, one for Dominion and one for Exile, you'll have one auction house that all one trading post kind of mechanism that's shared between both factions. Interestingly, it will be split between two different types. So you'll have your auction house for trading, the snacky items, the epic loots and stuff like that. But you'll also have a commodities exchange as well, 
for trading things like raw materials and the cred tokens. This means that rather than having huge listings of things like uh, lumps of metal and bits of wood which dominate the auction house, the only listing that you'll see is the lowest possible price. That means that you'll be able to go in and you'll say, okay, that's the cheapest, I'll buy the cheapest. And anyone who's got anything listed any higher won't even show on your screen. You also won't see who's actually put it up for trade as well. You'll just see, oh, there's wood at that particular price. I think that both of those dynamics are quite interesting, partly because it means the crafters, the people who actually make stuff, get their names listed on the auction house um, as, as manufacturers and traders. So if you want to have a bit of faction loyalty, or if you want to um, uh, patronize a particular trader, you can do that. But if you're, just, um, if you're just after raw materials to make something with or to level up with, then you don't need to worry about trying to sort through 20 pages of loads of stacks. You just go and buy what you want. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably a good move, uh, particularly it being cross-faction um, uh, cross as well, which is quite mm -hmm. interesting. Apparently, Fair it's going to be Protostar who's going to be doing the, uh, the cross-faction stuff. So I, don't <laughs> I don't trust them. I don't trust them. I am sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> Bless you. I don't know if I caught that sneeze in time or not, but there we go. You did, but it was Wonderful. rather fun to watch. <laughs> there you go, then. Uh, um, a couple that... of uh, comments from go, the, go, go. the peanut gallery. Mm -hmm. Our viewers, um, the disc says, if a lot of people decide and pick their servers before launch, will there be many people actually needed to chat cross-server? And I'm going to let you know right off the bat, the number one area where I am going to have issues is if I can't chat cross realm to my American players on their American servers. I may not necessarily want to do an instance with them because they'll have their own things going and I'm on a EU time, but when they're on, I'd love to be able to say, hey, I'm bored, let's go do something together. But again, that's a realm thing and that's something yeah, that I'll let's... refrain on for the moment. Well, <laughs> I seem to be full of opinions today. It, it completely depends on how the uh, how, how the accounts are set up. If you have one master account system that is both EU and uh, US based, and you just have database replication between them, then yes, within uh, it's within the realms of possibility f for that to happen. If you have the original Blizzard model, which was to try and reduce network latency wherever possible, and have basically two separate account registration systems then that's not going to happen. You won't get any kind of cross realm communication. But we'll see. I mean, it's one thing that was kind of baked into the Guild Wars 2 model, and that was more recent with uh, much more recent technology and much more recent internet topologies. So it, it's definitely possible, but it depends uh, if it's something that Carbine themselves want to do. So we shall see that. Yeah, in that particular case. And yeah, apparently, yeah. Saluko says, I think they've been looking for launches like uh, Final Fantasy XIV, where lots of peeps got split from their friends. But to be honest, you tend to re-roll when you can just to get onto mm. the same servers, which is true. Yeah. And uh, Ryzen says, you constantly meet new people, and sometimes you find out that they play the same MMO, but on another server, which prevents you from playing together, which yeah. is another reason for all that stuff. It, it's yeah. also worth saying, if we look at pre-game communities, um, One Stars is the strongest I think I've ever seen in any MMO. Um, hats off to them. Um, I, what you see in places like Wildstar Central, um, credit to, to Zach Robo, RPG. to RPG, there's the RPG PvP. one. They're, they're, I, I, could list, I could list them all, but I'd, I'd take too long. Mm. But each one of those nuclear community hubs has some real strength about it. There's relationships being formed uh, whilst we all wait for Wildstar. And those guilds are going to head off to different servers. People are going to stay with their guilds and their close friends. So I see more requirement here to be able to say, talk to someone else. Um, you know, let's say, uh, to pick, pick a name we recognize, um, Starspun, we want to talk to Starspun. Well, the chances <laughs> are we're gonna end up being on a, a different server, which is a good thing for our pool of prizes. However, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see a need for it more so than anywhere well, there's, else. There's also, there's also the interesting thing. I don't know if you guys remember the Star Wars thing, but they allowed people to build their guilds on the site ahead of time. 
actually it's they the one thing they did amazingly well. They allowed their antagonists well. against each other, and then they did their best to just throw all the antagonists, etc., the people who wanted to have the faction challenges for PvP or what have you, together onto the same server. So, in a way, there is sort of something like that, I think, coming within the Wildstar community, because especially since they're seriously fostering exile, Dominion. I mean, even in the show, yeah. we have us be gazzy. Yeah, it's true. They you are ex them be yep. the Dominion. It, it, I... Exactly. And like, for example, the guild that we're in, um, we have this sort of slight fun antagonistic thing versus Ico's guild, who is one of our producers, by the way. Um, and they're Dominion, we're exile, and we're like, all right, let's hope we get onto the same server and let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. So yep. that I... kind of thing I get. I just... Yep. Yeah, I have to throw in on SW Tour comment as well. Much as though I have a long list of things I like to decry loudly about that game, which is probably an episode all to itself. Um, that is one thing they got very, very right that I've seen no one else do a better job of since, which was the staging process of taking a guild through to launch. Fantastic mm -hmm. for organized yep. guilds. Breath of fresh air. More, please. Yes. I hope Wildstar does something like that. I really do. I'd be, I'll put it to this way. I'd be shocked if they didn't. They seem mm -hmm. to really have their fingers on the pulse of the MMO market, of the MMO players, all the play styles of MMOs. I mean, if yeah. they don't do something along those lines for Mis us, mistrick. I'm going to be sitting here going, eh, what's wrong with you? But we'll see. Yep. Next up, um, EVE Online. Traditionally, a very hard game to get into. <laughs> Has a reputation for a bit of a learning cliff rather than a learning That's... curve. Some, someone linked that satisfying... graphic. <laughs> very, very satisfying once you get into the game, but it can be a bit of an uphill struggle, particularly some of the in-depth nuances. CCP realizes this, and they've actually started. Rather than trying to enhance their tutorials, they're going to be running training missions. So they're going to actually be logged in as... Um, GMs and take people through how to play EVE Online. I think it's quite interesting because there was, at least up until recently, I think it still exists, a player-run organization called EVE University. It still it exists. Has, it also has a bit of a major drawback that getting into the organization mm -hmm. can take a matter of weeks in terms of going through all the tutorial stuff, applying to the university, getting your interview, getting accepted. So you're looking at about a month's worth of, of training of waiting before you can even get in. Um, I think that CCP realizes this is that this is a bit of a bottleneck and they're trying to uh, get around it somewhat. But I think it's great that they're, get, they're rolling up their sleeves and getting their hands dirty. Um, so I think that ideally, though, they should improve their tutorials. But. So CCP oh, are using their own. A GM resource or recruited player resource for this? Their own GM resource for this. So what is the cost to serve to take someone through this? And how does it relate to the retained value of an account? Because that so, throws some huge, fascinating questions my way. So I think it's yeah. going to be kind of... Uh, it's kind of a group activity, so it's not a one-on-one okay. -on -one thing. It's a group activity, and they've got timetable sessions in place for them to do that. But I can just see a group where you're just sitting there having to go, yes, that's what he said. Yes, that's what he said. Are you actually reading or listening to what this guy is telling you? How many training sessions, it makes a difference if you're talking games or yeah. just in business. Do you sit there and you always have that one or sometimes two who are just so neurotic that they yeah. put no effort in and they're just like, ah, me, me, me. Mm. So I how think are they going to screen that one? It's going to be interesting. Sessions will be recorded as well, so if you want to catch them on YouTube afterwards, <laughs> you'll be able to do that. And they've got a full timetable set up on their site. You can browse through and say, okay, I want to find out more about this, that, or the other. Um, EVE Online is still a game that I would recommend people get into and at least try, because it's so different to everything else out there. And, you know, internet spaceships, always good. I may have to, just for the experience, so I can talk about it afterwards, actually go and do one of these sessions. As someone that hasn't... I've touched this game for about a week, about four years ago. Um, Eve is not something I've ever got into, because my impression at the time was I will never catch up on skill points to be competitive. 
Um, so I may, I may have to go and do that and go through that experience and report back. Well, I did the Eve uh, tutorial based on talking because Gazi is so, you know, vocal about his appreciation of how different it is. Of course, I'm going to try something. Um, but I did the Eve trial, and I did not have enough time to complete all the tutorials, <laughs> just so that you know. So there is a heck of a lot in the game, and yeah. I just remember my time expiring and me just going... Oh. You just have to buy the full version now. Well, yeah, because I have nothing else I'm doing <laughs> at all right now. I'm just going to sit there and let my spaceship fly. Fine. Although I've heard a lot of people state that they play EVE at the same time as they play other MMOs. Because yes. it takes so long to travel, they'll have EVE going in the background. And it's not too intensive for resource-wise for your system mm -hmm. to be running it. And they'll just send their ships off to distant planets to do whatever runs they're doing. And then they'll go tab back into a different MMO and play that at the same time. It's like, yeah. eh. I, <laughs> That's I, multitasking, brought to you by today's MMO players. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it with Vanguard. <laughs> <laughs> EVE Online is one of those games that will run on almost anything. To give you an example, it will happily run on the lowest settings, even on a 2007 iMac. So... <laughs> Yes, you have to have the graphics settings on potato, but it will work quite happily. Is that as you what it's called in the slider? You know, potato, aubergine, cream Yeah, yeah something actually, like that. actually pretty much. You, you start off with, you know, the kind of clocks where you have a potato and two anodes and a cathode and it powers a little digital clock. <laughs> it's that kind of level of processing yeah. power. Can you upgrade by getting a um, lemon? It, well, no, lemon's a couple of notches up on the slider. So there's that. And then finally, Last piece of news, BlizzCon, the hey. Swagathon has begun. The gates are open, and you can now oh, buy your swag so from fair. the... Yes. <laughs> I am... I, okay, I, my wallet was not prepared for such <laughs> magnitude of swag. Okay. Um, I can, so I can, I, I'm already... Your picture. wallet was not. I'm already so, picturing you in the World of Warcraft Judgment Tier 2 Paladin robe, Gazimov. Well, this would have been fantastic if I'd actually ever played a Paladin, but no. <laughs> if they had the, uh, a Magister's or an Arcanist bathrobe, then we would be having a different discussion. <laughs> ah, but which one? Probably... Tier 2, Tier 1, Tier 0.5? Ooh, Ooh, take you back mattered. in the day. I don't Ooh. think it would have mattered. It would have been... That is a mage bathrobe. I am a hundred dollars <laughs> worse off. <laughs> um, All I can say is I'm glad there's no hunter one. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to have the robes of transcendence, you can have the bathrobes of transcendence. Um, there is, however, something which is probably going to sell out fairly rapidly. I know that the Murloc purple or lilac plushie has already sold out. I'm not sure if the Baneling zergling transforming plushie has sold out as well. Uh, but I am one of the lucky few that has purchased one of those, and hopefully it will be winging its way to me shortly. There's a bunch of other stuff on there as well, some posters, a Mahjong set. An that's epic-looking Mahjong set, I have to say. I am so mad right now. Tag. I, I am so angry. <laughs> Why are you angry? I swear, Gazzy, you do things purposefully to antagonize me. I want a robot plushie, and you have one, and I don't. That's what I'm saying. I have, I have a Murloc hat and a Murloc. I think I have a Murloc. No, I didn't order I the have, Murloc plushie. I have a Murloc that when you squeeze his tongue, he goes. Rah, 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 rah. So I'm okay for that, but it's purple. It would match the MMO buff it's, show. It's little Murkai plush Murloc. It's it's sold out. You'll have to ask Mr. Mispa to get you one. <laughs> anyway, there's been some comment in the chat on this particular topic, and I just want to bring this up. Um, it's actually the disc says, is there any plans for us to discuss the Vivendi news and what that'll mean? Without Vivendi looming over them, they can more easily try out new IP, new ideas that they would have been too risky before in the past. So Now, do we uh, want to handle that now? Or okay. do we kind I, of want to wait? Let's give it a, a quick whirl. I will, I will touch on this very, very mm. briefly. Um, so basically, Activision uh, Blizzard was looking to separate from Vivendi, and there was a shareholder block 
put in place. Some of the shareholders okay. felt that there was some kind of an unjust enrichment going on. Uh, that's now been removed by the courts and the uh, buyout is allowed to take place. So uh, basically Activision Blizzard are buying the remaining Vivendi shares. I think they're leaving Vivendi with about 18% ownership. So Activision Blizzard will be in majority control. Um, whether it uh, will result in the uh, company taking more a greater or a lesser risk in terms of future games development and the maintenance of their ongoing games, I don't think there'll be much change, to be honest with you. Uh, mainly because one of the philosophies for games development is keep working on the hits and keep getting them out on a regular basis. You've only got to look at Call of Duty uh, and Battlefield 4 on the EA site to see that that's generally what the big studios and the big firms try and go for. Hearthstone was a bit of an oddity in that it was almost a kind of skunk works project developed by 20 people in their spare time initially until they just uh, discovered that it was something that was actually uh, quite popular and could actually turn into a big game. I think it's that kind of um, uh, initiative that studios are going to be embracing a bit more. We've seen it also with CCP and Eve Valkyrie. And there's no reason why little projects like that can't mm. happen. But I think it's a lot of people looking at things like the Indiegogo market and the Kickstarter market and saying, okay, how can we make small games that people already know and love the gameplay for them, but giving it that little bit of blizzard polish mm -hmm. to try and make it something special. And I I, I'm going to immediately special. just sit there and say blizzard polish, I'm waiting to see it. <laughs> Honestly. I, I, may I? Can I? Can I please? Shall we, shall we, shall we segue into there? the main topic? I only want to segue into it because, you know, you're mentioning a polish here, and I have as many people know who actually watched my lovely, horrible challenge yeah. of going from Just zero to moment. 90 We've... in World of Warcraft. We will get there. So, what? balancing act. Whoa, I'm going to come straight back to you in just a moment. I'm confused. Yeah, and oh, we got a confused. So here's the confusing bit. So that was a bit of news with our faithful news hound, Gazimov, as he's now forevermore going to be known. And it's time to introduce the main topic. And we're going to go to Sudo to kick this one off. The main topic is the balancing act. So where do we perch on this precipice? And which way will it go? Sudo. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. So what we're talking about when we're talking about the balancing act is what it literally takes to bring a game that is enjoyable and literally balanced in the MMO market, which as anyone can tell you from patch note to patch note to patch note to expansion to patch note is very difficult. Now I've had the luxury of going back into World of Warcraft for this leveling challenge that I was put into and a couple of things became very, very apparent. As Gazi was saying earlier, there is an interesting, it would be interesting to see what Blizzard can do with their polish. Um, fortunately, I used to think World of Warcraft was polished. It's not. There are so many bugs. There are so many issues. There are so many random things that it doesn't seem polished anymore. Now, this could be me going back with the eyes of there's something there, but there is the frustration. But they have had so many expansions, as we've discussed, and so many patches to try to keep things balanced that they've kind of screwed up, I think. But that's sort of where it starts. Uh, I remember yesterday listening to a guild member complain that he was sick and tired of his ambush, ambush as a rogue, one-shotting every mob. It became boring for him. But that kind of balance for that mechanic, for that class, had to be there at low levels so that they could do the high-level things that they wanted. So if you got to rating, you're not going to be able to one-shot a boss, but you need to have that damage balance there for that particular class. Yet at low levels, it got really boring walking up one-shotting absolutely everything. That doesn't teach someone how to play their class. It doesn't teach them that. But learning a class is one thing. Talking about how we actually balance things out, how we balance the play styles with an MMO, how we balance the gear for all the different classes, how we balance the classes themselves, the combat mechanics. And that's sort of what we're talking about here. Now, I'm frustrated because, yeah, I kind of agree with him. It gets really boring, 
but I understand that they've done it because they have to have it because of the changes they've made to the entire tree system and to the entire talent thing for the upper levels in the Mr. Pandaria rating. Fair enough. But it's kind of gimped and screwed things over because of that kind of balancing act that they're doing there. I really like the balancing act. But anyway, so basically, before we go off into many, many tangents, because this topic is massive, let's nail down what the actual mechanics we want to talk about are. So I'm going to let Gazzy go first, <laughs> mainly because he's not wearing orange. <laughs> okay, so there's the, there are various ways in which you try and balance a game. You try and say, okay, do we want it balanced while we're leveling? Usually not, because leveling is leveling. Uh, you only really want to make sure that you can uh, have a reasonable challenge for doing encounters, but you're not really balancing around that. You want to be balanced around end game, usually nine times out of ten, because that's where players will clump up at the end. Mm -hmm. It's also why you 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 find a lot of things like uh, battlegrounds as people are leveling up. You usually f encounter things like twinks and stuff like that because people will work out okay, what's the most overpowered class, uh, and we'll use that. We'll give it a load of uh, spangly items, and we'll use that to uh, dominate all of the bits and pieces. So it basically becomes this situation where, okay, we're only going to balance around end game. What type of end game do we want to balance around? Do we want to balance mm -hmm. around the all the different classes versus a boss? We need to understand that certain classes are going to be melee based, certain classes are going to be range based. And so you've got to be able to balance every single fight against every single class just by the All the stuff? <laughs> yeah. I, and then you've got, okay, try and balancing for PvP. Now, are you talking 3v3, 5v5 arena PvP? Are you talking about battleground PvP? Are you talking about something like War Plot or World v World PvP, where you've effectively got a zerg of two bunches of people that occasionally collide with each other? So your, your most difficult parts are deciding where do you want the balance points to exist around? Do you want people to be uh, balanced around uh, raiding so that you can uh, say that every class ha at least has a role to play within a raid and that uh, overall they'll bring mm, roughly the same amount of damage. That's still a bit difficult uh, to balance, but the hardcore guilds will demand it, otherwise they'll just bench people who play the, the weaker classes and pull in the people that play the stronger classes. Do you want to balance it around arena PvP or the most tight and structured forms of PvP that you have to make sure that teams truly have a challenge? Then it becomes more difficult, just in terms of making sure that you've got players who can consistently face a challenge against each other. If you find that one class is particularly dominant, then you'll find that th that class or combination or mix of classes ends up dominating the PvP ranking. Well, there's also the, at least in the endgame mechanics, the balancing of, we'll say, raids, where you're required to have certain add-ons, if Ooh. anyone remembers Decursive. Ooh. Um, but what you're talking about, it's, it's a matter of finding out, I think in that case, what the purpose of the game is. Where the real meat of the game is, is one type of balancing act. And once, if you have that kind of concept of, it's going to be endgame based, that's where it's going to be. And that sort of seems to be the direction at least WoW has taken things in currently mm -hmm. because of the serious changes at low level mechanics. But then you have to counter and then you have to, I should say, pull in the fact that you've got the different class types and yep. the different classes. And one of the big complaints about WoW was the homogenization, where the difference between, say, playing a Resto Druid versus a Holy Priest is negligible. It's just the name of the actual ability. Sort of like Tor. You, you had your Sith and you had your Jedi. Exactly the same classes, just different names. There was a complaint about that. And there's the balancing yeah. of, you know, the different classes. And even in Guild Wars, there's this choice. Well, I actually, let me, let me step away from Guild Wars. Let me go into EQ next. There is this concept of the triad being not as necessarily important. And that yeah. being a, prod, a part of the end game balancing act for that. But, you I mean, when you start talking about classes, I mean, how much really needs to be balanced for an MMO? 
Well, let's take okay, let's so take let's take it back classes. a step first. And I, I've and I've and I've got the button, okay. so, so I'm I'm going to push it. I've not I've not had a word yet on this one. That's because <laughs> well, I sit and orange. watch Pseudo and Gazimus discuss. That's um, because we do it out. Well. Let's let's go back a step because we've started to get into the specific mechanics and choices in a given game. And I have to say, first off, I do not agree with some of the statements you've made already about WoW, but we'll get there in a minute. Let's be non-game specific and say balance. What is the aim? And there was a, uh, a great episode of, and I can't think of the show title, I'm sure you'll prompt me in a second, um, Gazimov. Extra uh, credits. Extra credits. Thank you. I had the theme song going in my head and couldn't come up with the title. Um, talking about balance. Not sure how old the episode was. And uh, what is balance? And do we want that perfectly weighted seesaw where you've got something here and you've got something here and they totally cancel each other out? Well, considering an environment we've got eight classes, could be PvP, could be PvE, could be anything at all, frankly. But if they all achieve exactly the same balance point, what is the point of playing one over another versus the, the flavour of button you like to push? So the concept was put forward in Extra Credits that one of the aims or goals of perfect design balance is to come up with, with, your, with your curve. Jedi curve was the example used in Magic, I do believe. And to let certain things deviate it from, from it slightly mathematically. And that as a designer, you need to be able to articulate verbally what your design intent with a class is. Hey, this guy heals, but it's got this awesome ability to put a um, absorption shield on stuff that will let people get through burn phases more easily. Great. Versus this guy heals, but he can stack a, a hot on something. So if you've got a, a long, slow damage tick over time, your healing becomes easier. So they both do the same net, but they do it a different way. They both deviate mathematically on a curve how they apply their healing. And that is the concept of imperfect balance, because when you put those two up against each other, in a given scenario, one is always going to win. If you're in a, uh, a competitive arena, it's going to mean the metagame is going to keep shifting. Hey, hunters are awesome, they can do this. Hey, so-and-so is awesome, they can do that. But it keeps things interesting. Um, and I do believe the Dota example can be given there in that this is awesome and everyone plays it until this thing counters it. So everyone plays it. But wait, this thing is awesome. It beats it. Yep. And round it's and round rock, and paper, round scissors, we syndrome. go. Well, it's, it's more like, the, it's more like the, uh, the one with about 32 different sorts that was introduced. <laughs> yeah. um, rock, Spock, enough. whatever, whatever it was. Um, yeah, it's, you can't it's have sort of perfect balance, balance and be entertaining. You need yep. um, a connected balance between all elements that gives you a balanced whole. Yep. I would agree with that to an extent. Um, also, but the, the basic problem that you've got when you look at things like Dota, and I'll, I'll touch on Dota briefly, but I know that the meat of what we want to talk about is with, is with MMOs. So with Dota, you've got um, 32 different, um, or you've got hundreds of different um, heroes that you can pick or champions that you can pick. But you don't have to invest heavily in one of those champions in order to at least be able to access it and have a few games with it initially to start off with. You, you, once you've unlocked the champion, that's it. With World of Warcraft, you've got a, you, you roll your character, you pick the class, and then you've got a large amount of leveling investment as you progress up to end game. And that's one of the big bugbears for a MMO player, is that you invest an awful lot of time in playing your character, leveling it up to cap, gearing it up, making sure that you're proficient with every single mechanic that character has, making sure that you've invested time in, in selecting the right talent specification and stuff like that, and all the other specializations that your character can have. And then for some reason, it's just not as um, powerful as other classes for the kind of roles that you tend to play. So you might be a ranged DPSer for raiding and you find that consistently across the board your character or your class that you've chosen is weaker regardless. Now in regular raiding that's not too much of an issue because they'll pick the player more than the class and that was a match that was echoed an awful lot but that was because the, at the low end of raiding there was a large skill headroom where a player with a lot of skill and a lot of capability yep could raise the bar about what they were able to 
achieve with that character. At the high end of raiding, when you've got very small amounts of difference between someone who can play very, very well a class A and someone who can play very, very well class B, they get the cream of the crop, the best players in their guilds. Those differences between class balance, between one class and another, matter an awful lot. And they will just bench people wholesale in order to get around that. I, I would like to issue. throw in, though, I think that headroom, skill headroom, in a well-designed yeah. game should go way beyond, let's say, low-level, mid-level, and even start to get into upper-level rating. I'd like to think in a well-designed game that's only true in the top 1%, 2%, where everyone is so darned good anyway. Yeah, and I would really, really agree with you there, but the problem with WoW, the big problem with WoW, is that your, your proficiency, your skill and your ability was determined pretty much by how much you could practice the synchronized swim. Yeah, as long as you knew the sequence of buttons to press, and I have done hardcore raiding, so I'm gonna speak from a, I would argue that yes, you have a bunch of numpties. What about utility? Who are, yeah, who, who are kind of floating in the kind of midstream, but amongst the hardcore, it really is, how much time can you throw yourself against this wall? Now, in newer games with active combat, I would say that that skill headroom has been lifted dramatically now. And oh. we're going to see with games like, if, we, if Guild Wars 2 had raiding, we would see it. With Wildstar, we'll have raiding, we will hopefully see a much bigger spread between the guilds that are good and the guilds that are really, really good. I, I want to come back on your points, but let's, let's pseudo come in first. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying that so we don't eight. go on to 10 new points. The only thing I wanted to bring up is the fact that in some cases, the game designers actually force people to bench. Um, I mean, imagine trying to walk into Nax. We're talking old school Nax, as well as, you know, the more recent one as well. And you don't have anyone who has the ability to dispel poison. Yep. That, I mean, in some ways, in some ways, this is back in the day before pretty much everyone could do all the things minus one. You know, it, they, they've made a lot of mechanic changes to a lot of what the classes can do. To I mean, we have spell interrupts on things. We've got reses on things that are just like, what, you've got a res? Okay, then. You know, there's a whole bunch of changes that they've made to almost bring out the balance because then you were benching people because you needed X for Y. And I think, I don't know. In a way, I kind of enjoyed that, and in a way, I kind of didn't, because it was sort of your class had purpose beyond yeah. just simply you were so, pixels on the screen. So but here you get to my, one of the key... My big problem with that, just... Go, Gazimov. Go, Gazimov. <laughs> my, my big problem with that, just to kind of bounce back in, was that you would take a player who either sucked or was completely toxic to your raid group purely because they could either uh, combat res or decurse no, we or wouldn't. something else that their <laughs> no, character you don't. Have... <laughs> No, you don't. No, I would never do. No, I wouldn't. No, no. First, first no. hand experience, no. No, so absolutely if, not. If it, okay, so if it was a choice between defeating the boss or yeah. benching the person not defeating the boss, you would not defeat the boss. I would work out that someone was toxic in environment and attitude first, have them out of the guild and replace them with someone suitable and appropriate. Whereas in Ideal my particular situation. case, I would see if the person who was going to be benched actually had an ult that could potentially do it and work with them on that level so they can still be a part of things. Well. You know, someone does, you don't have to sit there and just pull Joe Schmo out just because you need something. That's one of the things about MMOs. You're fostering a community. You can't foster a community if you don't go out there and look for what you need. If you know what you need because the raid says X, Y, Z, you can foster that community. You can help raise up your people, lift them up. It's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's... Uh, I would say that you've been very, very fortunate then. And I have had to deal Calculating with Calculating and controlling, yes, <laughs> not necessarily fortunate. I, I, I would say that I have had to raid with people who we would really not have wanted but because their class has got some spangly ability yeah. that we've needed to defeat a boss, we've taken them yeah. with us. And I... yet, people have eventually created alts so that we can boot them out of their ear, but it, it was a difficult They shouldn't as, have been as, in your guild in the first place, as as, and as <laughs> Why they were says, still there is beyond me. And as Stixie says, you don't go shopping for a tomato and pick a potato. 
American or English accent version of either. Um, Gays, Dixie. <laughs> one thing I will say is that does happen. It did happen. It will continue to happen. And actually, I see that as a symptom of lazy and poor guild management, not a fault of balance mechanics. Because actually, yeah, you get to the argument of homogenization versus utility. And I would love to see tons and tons of utility and secondary and tertiary abilities that are class-specific or multi-class-specific that have value. Let's go back to my age-old favorite of the hunter. There have been times and builds where it is not top of the DPS tree, even if you raid perfectly. You can get darned close, but if someone else is doing so perfectly, you won't overtake them. Now, at Warlocks. times, yeah, different point, but it's been top as well. You know, the game ch changes over time. However, Very true. now consider that a well-played hunter can trap, trank, um, move aggro around. Um, has got some great movement abilities with itself, pet control, off tank, emergency saves. Uh, you can do all of that while maintaining pretty nearly a perfect damage rotation if you're really good at playing your class. So that extra utility, those clutch saves that you can pull out of nowhere on a good day when you're awake, um, adds so much to the class. Does it always need to be equal in DPS? And actually, I would say no, because you bring that level of player ability and you bring that level of class utility, it's still balanced because it adds something different. And that is better is, balance. The problem is the perspective of the players. We have a generation that grew up on uh, you know, using SCADA and using damage meters, and their whole belief was damage meter equal all. That's not the case. The reality is a well-executed, at least in my opinion, raid will have some people who fluctuate around on the meters because they're doing something else. Doing different Hiding jobs, a boss halfway times. across, putting things down, waiting their turn because you need to have some kind of balance. Back in the old school days where you had to have different healing groups call out because of mana conservation. I mean, we're talking old school things that actually force people to work together in a community environment, but it was done that way because yeah. things so were designed that way. There's two things here. There's first of all, this is why. There's always two things. <laughs> this this is why raid leaders don't just use damage meters in order to audit. Mm -hmm. uh, Banned like, in raids. They look at uh, damage taken, uh, healing absorbed, uh, all those kind of bits and pieces that make up. Uh, you might have done the best damage, but if you've been standing in the bat all the time and some healers had to go nuts healing you, then that's not an effective use of raid resource. But there's Going back to your point, Mispa, yes, hunters went up and down, but I still remember a certain core hound in Molten Core <laughs> where hunters had to tranquilize and shot it every so often. So you, you could say all you like, but I still remember when you were in a raid <laughs> because you had one ability that no one else had. So. I can honestly say we've never taken a hunter to a raid because that's the only thing it could bring to the party. <laughs> At Not, that point in like, time... I, yeah. I can that's, also that's say we've tried to defeat that boss with no hunter just for fun, but there we go. <laughs> yeah, but you can see the kind of, the, this isn't so much the, it's kind of like the, the player perception that X class is there because they bring Y to the table. X class, like druids were there because they brought combat reses to the table and shamans as well. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's the kind of And the of druid thing. dance. Yeah, well, but you, you kind of get to the stage where you, you think, well, I'm just here as DPS. DPS is all I do. I have nothing special to bring to the table. Why bring just a pure DPSer when you can buy, bring a DPS with utility? It's why with Wildstar, I'm much more optimistic because they're bringing in the path system. And it's from what we've been told, it's the paths in raids that will have a lot of kind of this, that, and the other. So in those respects, I'm a lot more optimistic because I think that they are going to that's where the utility will come in that's where players will do X Y and Z during a fight I could be wrong because we haven't seen any raids yet apart from the vine that <sighs> Stefan Frost posted but um, I think that's really kind of where it's going to where that utility that you mentioned Mispa, is going to pop out so, so what, what can we take away from this before we jump on and I'll, I'll come back pseudo to you and screen in a second I, yeah, I want to wrap this one up pick it up and move on a step um, yeah. 
we've identified, I think, and concluded that you do not need to be doing 137 DPS each to be balanced. There could be a class that does 140, one does 120, brings some other stuff to the table. That is still balanced. Um, mm -hmm. We'll go back and pick up on the Screen Ninja comment, uh, but I want to talk about another aspect of balance, um, one which is the pet peeve for many. Hello, my name is Left Hand, even though it's on the right of the screen, and I PvP. Hello, my name is Right Hand, and I PvE. Ah, but if I do this in PvP, then this happens. Wait, that breaks PvP, and vice versa. PvP versus PvE. Why abilities and changes and patches from one to the other affect each other's styles of gameplay. So first, pseudo Screenager's comment, and then you can pick up that lovely chestnut. Yes, Screenager pointed out that there is an MMO that brings utility to the table and uses it to balance classes. That is very true. A lot of games are now doing that. This seems to be the... They, the world has heard that people are sick of real balance, which is the total equality balance, and they want the individuality yep. and all the troubles that come with it. You have to make concessions. You're not going to be perfect at everything. Screw God mode, people. Get really good at what you do and your utility <laughs> yes. and go with it and be the damn best, you know, trank hunter you've ever been before. Don't rely on stuff. But yes, moving on with your question. Are you wishing me to address this? You, 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 the PvE, you, PvP. You may, you may address it. Please put the world to rights, fix it, and let us never have this problem again. Okay. If we want to do it and fix it and never have this problem again, two different talent trees, exactly the same. One for PvE, one for PvP. Literally not usable in each. So if, say, Trank Shot works a certain way in PvP, you have it something different in PvE, you can then tweak something without messing with the PvE stuff. Try it. That's yeah, not <laughs> difficult to that. That was, no, I, that, that, now, I'm going to warn you. I said that as a joke because that has been one of the number one ways that people have tried to fix the problem. Okay. And it has so, failed repeatedly. So here's, here's a classic <laughs> mage core ability, polymorph. In PvE, you can polymorph something as long as you like. In PvP, you can polymorph something for 10 seconds with diminishing returns your polymorph ability is now much more useless. Now, arguably, that polymorph ability was probably a bit overpowered in PvE, but then again, it's one of those things that it only really helps you in dungeons. As soon as you go into raiding, you can't use it at all. And I think that, well, again, Wildstar's interrupt armor system is a nice way of getting around this whole crowd control yes. stuff. Yes. So, I, I think, and the fact that players will have interrupt armor as well. And bring we'll back see. more crowd control, please, across the board. It, it seems it to be disappearing back... all over the place. Exactly, and the reason it's disappearing is because people are struggling to balance it between PvE and PvP. But you look at systems like Guild Wars 2 has reasonable levels of crowd control, um, but then none of them are very long. They're kind of like a, f a few seconds here and there. And I'm looking forward to Wildstar hopefully having a similar style of approach with, with their PvP systems. I think, again, that will be some way of trying to get around the problem. But it harkens back to the kind of basic combat principles. You're not just targeting something and hitting a button. You actually have to move around and, and mm. aim and, and use it basically on a much more dynamic basis. Congrats, you so. healed a tree. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think the reality is when you have a game that focuses on both, and I think this is why we are seeing so many games that are purely devoted to PvP or have that as their big focus and then they're kind of eking in a little bit of PvE, is because the balancing is going to be that difficult. How do you bring the class utility that makes the class stand out for what it is and bring it from taking a boss down to taking down a player? I mean, I don't know if you guys remember the old school... Uh, rogue videos where rogues used to run around in nothing but like greys and it was their weapon damage that did all their things and they just go through and in pvp demolish people i don't know it, the rock paper scissors thing made me think of this rock you know rogue is this i can't remember what it was called but then you've got the application of them doing it inside a raid and they still have that same kind of even keel but then you have everyone else who's at different and then 
it just, I think it's, is it's, there really a way to balance the two? Well, I, th yes. I think there's quite an interesting systematic process that um, most of the modern PvP games that we see that are very, very successful are MOBAs. You do not have an, a, uh, an eSport that is pretty successful in its own right that's housed inside an MMO. World of Warcraft got close and they heavily pushed it. Uh, Firefall didn't get anywhere near it. Guild Wars 2 is trying to push it, but it's still not. E it's not taking off. It's it's kind of struggling to get that ramp up. Um, and I don't think that WildStar will, will do that. I think that most players who want to play competitive PvP on a pseudo balanced uh, battlefield will probably balanced by me. Yeah, balanced by pseudo. Will probably pick <laughs> something like a MOBA or an arena PvP. Um, only online game, and that will be the only thing they play. Uh, apart from the fact that you had Warhammer Wrath of Heroes, which was terrible. But, uh, I think I think Greg disagrees. Um, one thing you do have, though, that's pretty unique to a MMO environment, is you get the strong voices in each camp saying, well, I am a PvPer. I play this game for PvP and nothing but the PvP, so why are you breaking my PvP? But as same <coughs> token, you get those of us who PvE primarily, and I'm, apart from possibly Arena, I'm very much in that camp, um, saying the same thing. Well, we're here for dungeons and raids and leveling, and you can go and do your PvP in the battlegrounds. Why is this affecting my open world experience? So it's a remarkably difficult thing to balance. And to me, you have to use the environment as one of the balancing factors. There's so much you can do if you're happy to make that gameplay decision. So in a, a battleground, you walk in, you get some global effect, buff, debuff, and if needs be, half a dozen, a handful of your spells and abilities, they change. But what I wouldn't want to see is an environment whereby I've got uh, skill tree A and these 17 abilities, and now I've got skill tree B and these 17 abilities, because what happens to class, flavor, and feel? I would want expertise mm -hmm. and muscle memory and skill at the game that's been built up through time to coexist between both realms. Now, yeah. everything has a compromise, and the compromise here, of course, is open world PvP. And frankly, yeah. If open world PvP that is by its very nature inherently imbalanced when 42 people zerg three people, at least that's normally my experience of it, it doesn't yeah. need to be balanced. That can exactly, be yeah. unbalanced. That's, yeah. but see, that's, Call in more it, troops. It's going, it's going back to what we, what we were saying. It's going back to what was mentioned by Extra Credits. We are talking about a system where the reality is you can't have everything 100% 100 the way. No. You can't. You have to accept that the truth is imbalance is balance. And as long as you sit there and you scream, oh, but my class is always constantly being killed by X. Well, there's another class out there going, well, my class is constantly being killed by that class, which is constantly being killed by that class. Welcome yeah. to the balance system. And I think some people get it right. I think, however, some MMOs are screwing it up big time. So I think that to, to try and bring things uh, back to uh, the core of where we've got to, I think that one of the things I, I think one of the things that we've kind of all argued is that class homogenization, making everything feel bland and samey, is a bad thing. Classes need to have their own particular flavour and flair, just to keep mm -hmm. them interesting, just to keep them something unique and appealing. If and you play a flippity gibbet. You identify with it. If you play a flibbity exactly. gibbet, you identify it. You want to be a proud flibbity gibbet. Exactly. Exactly. So exactly. that's part. That's part of the importance of having a particular class. Have beyond that, we only really seek balance in particular areas and to particular levels, and those areas are generally er um, parts where you like to be at the bleeding competitive edge within the, that game. So things like raiding, arena, possibly war plot PvP. The instances where one individual's capability can make all the difference. But I think that the skill headroom with particular classes 
is becoming more and more critical. The ability to just do DPS and create impressive numbers is going to diminish as our games become more complex. And it's the ability of the player to be in the right place and to do, perform the right sequence of events and really demonstrate how they can play to the best of their abilities, which is, I think is going to become more important as games so continue to develop. Just before we I move on, talking about player headroom, and I'll come back to you just a second, Sudo, because we've got so many topics flying around. Um, one thing that I love and don't see enough of from my perspective is the concept of basic, intermediate, and advanced classes. Now, skill trees in WoW did this to a level, certainly with Hunters once upon a time. Um, tree A could get you the greatest DPS return, but was by far the hardest to play. And if you made small mistakes, you were at the bottom of the DPS pool, amongst other Hunters. Um, skill tree B gave you a good solid return, had a little bit of difficulty to it, but you could eke out you know, other people. But tree, uh, tree C could be played by mashing one button, would always get you a certain steady return. Um, I would argue that that is balanced, and that approach should be and can be taken into entire classes, where an entire class is just harder, but more rewarding when you get it right. I, Pseudo. I'm going to... I'm going to jump on your comment and then I'm going to jump on Gazi's comment because they kind of coincide in my brain. What you're, what you're basically speaking about is something that I think is a viable option if the game is designed that way and I think that's good. But I think that the starting playing field needs to have a certain level of difficulty to begin with. For example, there is a big difference between standing still and casting Shadow Bolt repeatedly <laughs> versus you know, casting your guns, moving out of the way, double jumping, sprinting across the way, maintaining your dodge, and that's just normal gameplay. We're not even into the dungeons yet. We're not even into the PvP. We're not even into the arenas. We haven't even touched that. That's just basic gameplay. Now, going back to what you were talking about, Gazi, in order for things in MMOs today and age to get to that point where, you know, it's not just about the DPS meters, the developers need to stop with the bloody DPS races and make it more about the not necessarily the swimming dance, but make it more about the strategy. The moment you start making something a DPS race, nobody gives a damn what anyone's class is as long as they are pushing the deeps. If you push in the deeps, you're in. End of story. And as someone had mentioned it, and I wish I could see it, but they'd scroll past, uh, I think it was actually Saluka who mentioned that looking for raid is turned into just this tie-in cesspool of people just going, oh, your deeps aren't good enough. Oh, your deeps aren't good enough. And that's because the mechanics of that particular boss fights and stuff is all about the deeps. Bring back the strategy. Designers bring back that kind of thing that forces the hunter to trank when they need yeah. to trank or to sheep where you need to sheep. And I think that needs to happen before people stop looking at those meters and saying that's but the end all be all. There is box. room for both. The brutalities and the patchworks of this world added something fantastic <laughs> that I wouldn't want to lose forevermore. Okay, okay. But, but, but patchwork was just purely a DPS check. It was a, it was a case of... If you are this high, to t if you are this tall in terms of the DPS, meter, you may ride this next Arabus ride. <laughs> and, and, yes. And, and, and that, I hate to say it, but that's really, really lazy, crap design. Um, Not if the rest of your raid encounter is balanced for that DPS point for onwards, and it's a fair that, gateway. Having said that, having said that, I think part of the problem as well is that we have seen raid design go from let's make things interesting for players to move around, try and get out the bad stuff, quite complex encounters where they have to be fairly agile to stand here, DPS the boss. Stand here, DPS the boss. And the simple reason for that is looking for raid. And let's it's everything awful, nice and terrible, yes. horrible, foul, disgusting. <laughs> but never mind. Carry on. Yes. Tell so, me how you really feel about it, Ms. because I'm not certain I or the rest of our population <laughs> understands where you are coming from or how you feel. But, yeah. I'm not a big fan. It's, it's part of the reason why when people say, OK, we're going to build raids that are tough, hard and, and brutal, it's because we're seeing uh, people go back to not necessarily the old school raid design where people actually had to move, and had to be able to play their class beyond just being able to mash a sequence of buttons, but because it's actually more engaging gameplay than just 
yeah, it's more fun. It's more interesting. You're more involved in what you're doing. And because of that, the rewards and the victories are much sweeter as a result. The Looking problem to... is giving them time to build those designs, though. I mean, we're looking at this from the gameplay perspective. The developers have to be the ones to actually build in the code and the mechanics to make these things happen. And yeah. that takes time, it takes money, it takes resources. And I think that's why a lot of the, we'll say, current raid designs out there are so lazy, because I don't think they get that anymore. I think people are so desirable of that three-week iteration, give me something new, give me something new, that how can you develop something with that level of complexity? I think that part of that is making sure that you have enough lead time for these things to drop in, uh, and that goes, goes back to... Are you uh, listening, Carbine? <laughs> Sorry. That goes to public <laughs> management uh, setup, and it's something that Guild Wars 2 and ArenaNet have mastered to a certain extent. It's worth saying people have done a very good job of appearing to solve yeah. that issue. So, but I think that it's it's also part of making sure that you have types of different types of content for different people. So rather than saying to someone, hey, you can play all of the content that's out here, which is the Warcraft approach, it's like, this is the content that we've deliberately put together Ooh, for you. Would you argue it's the Warcraft approach? They're famous back in the day, rose-tinted glasses and all that, of going, hey, only a certain percentage of people will get to see some of this content. And that's when some of the content and, and I haven't experienced all the new content yet, that's a work in progress, but was at its best. Exactly. I mean, the, the problem is now that you've got Looking for Raid, basically they've, they've said, okay, we're going to throw the gates open so everyone can do everything. So if you want to do raiding, you, can, you just need to find, uh, you just need to click a few buttons and you'll be thrown into Look for a Raid. Now the problem is that all the challenge of completing that raid is just sucked out of it. I remember doing um, the Dragon Soul raid, and I went through it once, completed it, and thought, well, I've killed the end boss now. I don't need to worry. I've killed, uh, Nef um, not Nefarian, um, Deathwing. That's it. That's the challenge gone for me. Yeah, I could quite happily do it on, um, on regular mode or on... Um, uh, the other, the more Heroic. advanced mode, but I've killed the boss, and all I care about is defeating the boss, seeing the dungeon. So um, com it was compare, looped. compare, compare for me the concept they now have of flex versus LFR. I I'm still making up my mind on flex, and I haven't yet experienced it firsthand as I'm in the middle of re-leveling, and I'm currently very low level. But your flex thoughts? Flex actually requires you to have a pre-made group. Correct. Period. Um, whereas LFR, not so much. Should we just touch um, on what Flex is for people that might not be aware of it? Flex is from its World of Warcraft's answer to allowing people who are not in a 10-man guild or a 25-man guild for being able to let them see the content, uh, whether you have 12 people or 18 or 21. And the actual difficulty and the drops actually scale to how many people show up. And I believe it's also pitched between LFR and a normal raid. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. So I, while I admire them for having procedurally generated uh, content where the complexity dynamically adjusts depending on the, uh, quanti the quantity and the quality of the player base that, that make up these dungeons, I still think that there is an issue there with... Um, basically trying to make content accessible to everyone. I think that it would be, they would be much better off trying to make content that specifically appeals to the masses rather than trying to make a content that's designed for advanced players more approachable to everyone. I think that's probably a bit of a mistake because it makes the whole experience very much watered down. And I don't think it can recover from that personally. But then again, this might be part of a longer term strategy where they're trying to make all World of Warcraft content accessible to everyone. Well, it's interesting if you note what they did at the same point in time they introduced Flex, uh, which I believe they did in 543 Siege. Um, they introduced that alongside the Legendary Cloak and another mm -hmm. uh, allegedly truly impressive, difficult boss. Um, you know, the likes of the do everything else, get the legendary cloak, teleport here, have a go at this. 
So they seem to introduce something for both streams of content at the same time. And to me, that seemed to be quite, to be honest, quite smart, joined up thinking and a breath of fresh air that I perhaps wasn't expecting with the, the harder content being in there as well. Now, how hard it's turned out to be, that I can't comment on. Hmm. So let's, yeah. let's, throw, let's throw one more in and then we'll have a, we'll have a wrap up because we've, we've talked about balance in a few areas. We've talked about the difficulty of balance between classes, levels, um, and play, classes and levels and concluded that actually you can balance DPS with utility and play styles with choice and that these things don't actually need to be as balanced as long as they contribute to the whole in a meaningful way. And that if you're right. just looking at a DPS number, well, if you're the guild leader, Put a bit more thought into it, please. It's the only way, the only way I can phrase it. How about anybody put some thought into it? Because honestly, if you just leave it True. on the guild leaders, that's like, what, one tiny percent yeah. of the population? No, that's, that's a very, very fair comment. But it is, of course, the, the, the guild leader or the raid leader who often makes those benching calls. Um, very true. Then we've also gone There's on and looked at uh, PvE versus PvP and said, well, okay, maybe we have to accept here that things won't always be balanced but let's make sure we put some controls in in the places where they're needed most. And that would seem to be the most appropriate solution. There may well be others out there. I still feel that's a problem that hasn't been fully solved and that a better solution is out there somewhere. Um, but let's talk about one other thing that often crops up in balance and we'll probably conclude on this one. Is this the debate that was going on inside the chat? Because they had a really interesting debate going um, on. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I'm going to touch on itemization, gear scaling, accessibility, and balance. Hey, look, I got my uber super secret sword of thingamy what's it with plus 1,000 to everything. Can I come and PvP with you now, please? Pseudo. Now you're just taking yourself back to the discussion about the tomato and the potato. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. You know, if someone's going to come around, running around like that and go, ooh, I've got myself this new shiny little awesome thing, doesn't mean that you should be raiding in my group with me or PvPing in my group with me. Because I don't recruit you based on the size of your mallet. I recruit you based on who you are. So, but but you know, size honestly... of mallet aside, the question is this. Is to what degree does the continual scaling of reward, because rewards always need to be meaningful to be rewarding, I've got my plus 10 reward six months ago, now I get my plus 11 reward, and I'm striving for my plus 12 reward, and then I get it. But at what point is my plus 12 reward actually a plus 37 reward, because the game's been out since 2005, and that actually the strength of this item is so out of kilter, or everyone's items need to keep scaling add eye level infinitum to use the wow example because hey they're the ones that have been around the block the longest so they're the they're really the only people and that's not actually quite true eq and others but they're one of the few people that's well exposed that people can look at and go well what actually happened in this instance and so how from a design perspective should people balance around long-term gear creep and power progression because guild wars had a solution to it and i have to say it made it the most boring soulless game for me with my exposure to going well what do i go for next well my my bow can shoot rainbows great how do i get a better bow i don't care about the cosmetics one iota how do i get a better one and it wasn't there yeah this is an interesting <laughs> one and i think this is one of the reasons why the wild star beta stopped because they needed to go back and re-itemize everything. At least this is what Gaffney said to us as to one of the reasons why they stopped the beta. When it comes to itemization of gear, you're going to have to figure out what type of gear you want the characters or classes in your game to have, first of all. Because that's going to impact what they can wear, what they can't wear. I mean, how many times do people get really pissed off because a cloth item dropped and a paladin got it and the priest did not where the paladin could wear every type of thing in game except the priest could not so you have to make a decision starting off on the bat as to what type of items you're going to have for gear and weapons etc who's going to use them who is going to have access to them and then you look at the stats what stats are actually going to be important are you playing a game where if someone 
where people have no control over their stats. Let's, let's take it back there. You are given X amount of strength every time you level. You are given X amount of strength uh, every time you put on a piece of gear with X strength. But what about the games where you actually can say, I want to put my five ability points in two strength and uh, one stamp. And you those know, are a good thing. When you, th Yeah, those are a lot of fun. When you actually get the ability to get nitty gritty and actually detail yourself down that far without, say, for forging, which was wild, or wows the trying to attempt to balance it. But that's when you start to ask yourself, or you start to see how big a picture it is with itemization. It's not just about making it look pretty. It's not just about saying this is going to level up with your level as it goes. It's about can you actually have an item in game that is usable, valid, and probably doesn't make you want to kill the other player because they can wear absolutely everything in game, so be it. I mean, Wildstar has said, you are a gunslinger, you get guns. Congratulations. <laughs> You're, and, and part of that, the decision was made because of the animations behind it. It allows them to build richer animations if you're just stuck with one gun. The design may change, but you're stuck with one gun. You get the same animations, etc. So how do you balance it when you start going into expansions? The reality is stop trying to do itemization. Stop trying to give them the 200% because you're going to screw it up because you're usually going to bring an expansion and change everything. So Don't. I, 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 I could argue there's a, there's a requirement to have progression, uh, but let, right. let's just skip that thorny issue for a moment and bounce to Gazimov. And after your answer to this, Gazimov, I have our concluding question for you to wrap your brains around. Okay. So there's two things here. First of all, you need to have some form of gear progression. Uh, I have a sword. If I want to, if I'm going to kill this particular boss. I want to know that there's going to be a better sword that I can get from that boss. Or a token, if I take the boss's head, hand it into a particular trader, he will give me a better sword as a result of that. Otherwise, it's a case of prestige. Yeah? And yeah. prestige only goes so far. Um, so you need to have some form of gear progression just to, in order to persuade, it, just in order to kind of act as a bit of a carrot for raiders to or anyone to go through. Otherwise, people will just hit level cap and think, well, there's nothing for me to do now because there's no way I can improve my character. If they've got veteran ray, if they've got veteran dungeons and stuff like that, then they've got new gear that they can work on. If they've got, uh, if they're a crafter, they might have high quality gear that they can work on. So there's, it provides them a bit of a motivation to continue playing beyond just hitting level cap and going, oh, I'm the best I can get now. Hello, SW Tour. <laughs> yeah, Swotor being a prime example. But the other hey. kind of, the other kind of attitude is that WoW wasn't the WoW gear structure wasn't really designed with, um, with 11 billion expansions and patches and stuff in mind. Uh. I don't think they planned WoW out more than a five-year kind of anticipation. They looked at the figures and went, yeah, that scale looks roughly right for five years, and now they're getting up to 10 and thinking, well, actually, we need to do something about it. And That's removed resilience to... from the game. Exactly. Let's just drop everything by a few orders of magnitude, which doesn't really work because you still need to give people incremental boosts, but you don't want to make the lobby players kill things in one shot. That's a di that's a difficult. That's actually a show time. by itself with maths yeah, and exactly. formulas and everything, and we should probably do that. That would but be fun. You, you, you can see that you can see the point though that if you've got a you need to have some form of gear progression but you don't want to over egg the pudding i think that again going back to wildstar they, they're trying to do that through this kind of milestoning system that uh, jeremy gaffin's touched on in the past where once you get your gear up to a certain level of stat points you get a big a more significant boost as, as a kind of one-off thing mm -hmm. that will help to an extent i think but mm. tying gear to progression is a difficult thing uh, in, the, in the best of times. I think that trying to do it from scratch, deciding just how, what kind of ramp to have, whether you want to have a flat line or whether you want to give it a curve or, or what, is it, that's, that whole thing is difficult. And and far, far better people than I are trying to work and, on. And indeed, some of the best minds in the industry are constantly yeah. trying to solve that problem. Let's not belittle it. Hey, we, we do this. Just employ us all now. We'll have yachts. 
Well, that's the thing. When you talk balance about anything, you are literally not going to be able to just quickly, easily solve something because the moment you start adding math to the equation, the it's going to have an impact. Math is fun. How, however, I want to come in with the concluding question, else we're going to overrun. And we kind of already have, but it's uh, been that's, great. That's why I'm what an interesting it just topic. A little bit. Um, let's try this one for size. Mm -hmm. You have the ability in game to balance one thing and only one thing only can you be certain that your game design will allow for that element to be balanced to whatever definition of balance you supply so in the game that you're creating what is the most important thing to balance and why and there are two incredibly thoughtful expressions staring back at me. So I'm going to start with the one that's going, oh, no, not me first, Gazimov. OK, so I'm going to give you a really horrible answer. And you're not going to like it, I'll tell you that. Everything is not allowed. OK, so <laughs> I'm not going to say everything. I would balance around professions, crafting professions, I would say, okay, every crafting profession has a role to play within the end game economy. I am sick and tired of having, say, two professions like alchemy and one other consumable based profession having a basis at end game and everyone else saying, okay, if I get a really rare recipe, that's fantastic, otherwise not. The reason I do that is because I want all crafting professions to have a use at end game, have a purpose and have a value. I think that um, as games continue to evolve, I think that we'll see skill become more important than uh, the power behind the particular abilities. Uh, and I think as that headroom grows, skill will become a much wider overriding factor. But I've always found that professions, you end up with one or two favorites that the designers tend to feel are entitled to make money and everyone else just uses it as a kind of way of gearing up themselves. So yeah. that's the one I would try and tackle most of all because that's the one that people are going to gripe around once they hit level cap and find their professions useless. So I think classes by and large as games evolve will become more balanced because it will be around your innate skill more than anything else. So Gazimov's um, crafting online is wonderfully balanced. You can all make things and sell them to each other fairly and evenly with no EU trade blocks required. However, pseudo. Right. First, I want to point out that um, All Star MMO pointed out that uh, you wanted to do racials, which is kind of funny. <laughs> it's own right. Ban the racials. Um, no, we like, we just, like just racials. Just trying to figure out how you balance the pancake with the OP waffle. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, I'm not certain you can balance the two, even with maple syrup. However, my, quet, or my answer is going to take it a little deeper to see something I would like to see. And if I could have just that one thing that is balanced, end of story, it would literally be the customization of your talents, skills, and base stats. That's a little near, near to everything as an answer. I there, didn't so mention you know. PvP. A little more specific. A little more sp I'm going to veto okay. that answer. Base a little stats. more specific, Base stats, please. end of story. There we go. Complete customization of your base stats. Balanced out. Okay. So if I want to be pure agility with no stam, let me. I'll die. Let me, let me make the decision. Actually, there's a danger there that that will turn out to be not so balanced and that any one stacking of particular stats has unintended consequences, especially How scaling. you allow people to apply <laughs> the base stats, I agree with you. But what I'm referring to ah, is you said, that let me be all agility. Nuts. Well, I was joking, okay? <laughs> that is a joke. Yeah. Agilely I mean, honesty, ducking the thorny issue of balance. Um, I have yet to see a game where you can control your base stats where you do not start off with at least some points in everything. Just I, uh, I, I have played a game of tabletop Dungeons and Dragons where I had okay. one impressive stat. I, I D&D. Let, let, me, let, me, let me just explain the situation. I had one impressive stat which I dumped into intelligence, I think it was. It meant I could one-shot kill with a fireball, <laughs> but I was crap at everything else. But as long as I got the first hit in, I was God. 
I am specifically <laughs> referring to MMOs. And yes, I know Neverwinter has allowed you to have control over that, but I'm talking about it being properly balanced. Okay. There we go. Well, I'm going to come in and come up with another uh, a, a one a one shot kill word, so to speak. And I'm going to say balance around utility. And I didn't take my it, I knew you were going to say that. rationale for utility <laughs> might not be what's expected. If there is a diverse enough call on different utility types and options within a game, and that all of them are seen as having viable points in play, and I don't mind if some are PvE, some are PvP, some are crafting, some are doing double backflips with shiny soles of your feet, really, really doesn't matter. Then as the metagame evolves, and as certain classes rise to the top and sink below throughout the patches, throughout the years, there will always be a purpose for your class. Ah, yes, but I can track shot the core hound, or I can do so and so and so and so, or I have a, a bloodlust, or a in combat res. Let's keep those unique abilities. Let's keep that flavor. Let's maybe have them on more than one class. Two is good, but maybe with some subtle differences. But let's allow that diversity. I mean, look at um, uh, EQ, EQ2, where these things started with so many classes, all these different racial sites, uh, and all these other bits and pieces that were fantastic. So balance around utility so we do not need to homogenize, and everything else can follow suit, and people can retain individuality. And that. And make pancakes. And, and make waffles. pancakes. And with that, we have skirted around the um, the balance questions. We have tiptoed across the tightrope, looking at the mountain of breakfast bacon that's been sitting underneath us. But we have not needed the pancake safety net, nor have we found ourselves smothered in maple syrup. And with that, I cross the rope towards the eggs benedict of success. And food references aside. MMO Buffet, brought to you by Mispa's Hungry Stomach <laughs> and Gasimov's Still Wanting Dinner. I eat. And on that note, it's goodbye from Gasimov. Goodbye. Hey, it's goodbye from Pseudo. See ya. Are we having a chat after the show with the peoples? I think so. So hang around, folks. Oh, in fact, don't go anywhere yet. Because there's something we haven't brought up. No, we we can't no. we can't no. leave we, we can't. can't leave you hungry. No, no, we can't. I'm going, Not I'm with going this. To, <laughs> I, I'm going to. I'm going to get on a train and slap you if you carry on with the food references. So we we like to provide you um, with all the meal tickets in the world, <laughs> and we have another one coming up. Um, do you want to handle it, Sudo, or shall I? Do oh, you I'm have all the details. Fine with this. Go, go, go. It's all the details. I don't know if I have all the details, but I have quite a few of the details. We'll, 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 throw, out the, we'll throw out the lefty stuff. Okay, the lefty stuff. Okay. Now, as you know, here on MMO Buff, we firmly believe in supporting everything because we believe in balance and equality, <laughs> even in its most <laughs> inequality state. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, God, I'm really bad tonight. However... Um, Something really awesome has happened with us. We've had a chance to get together with Razor and chat with them while we were at the Eurogamer Expo. Besides the fact is that, that Nick is YouTube? absolute... Yes, it is. I'm getting there. My goodness. Despite the fact that it's about Razor and the great peripheral products that are coming out for the MMO market, Nick is hysterical. The guy is great to listen to. So if nothing else, go listen to him because he is funny. On the side of that, though, they have sent to us something rather interesting. And normally, and I thought Miz was going to go into this earlier because of the way he presented the PvE and the PvP situation, but it didn't quite end up that way. Normally when a giveaway happens, it's being given to the populace of those who play with their right hand. In this particular case, we've decided to take it that one step further. We have actually been shipped a Naga Mouse from Razor for left-hand players. Not right-hand players, but for the lefties, the southpaws of our audience. So if you know somebody who is a left-handed genius, a left-handed mouse turner and clicker who needs a left-handed mouse from Razer with lots of buttons on the side, this side properly, you know, the left one for you to play with your left mouse or your left thumb on the mouse, you're going to want to get involved in our competition. But you're going to have to wait 
for Wes to announce what the competition is. Bear with us. Pay attention to our website. Follow us on Twitter at MMO Buff. Follow us on Facebook at MMO Buff. Follow us on YouTube at MMO Buff. Follow our website itself, MMOBuff.tv, because we're going to be bringing this out. And it's finally a chance for people who are usually left out of competitions to actually win something. Yes, you South Pole people, we are supporting you. Uh, and we might be following up with some more generic bits and pieces as well, but we're going to headline the 2014 left-handed Naga as a giveaway. And depending mm -hmm. on how quickly we can get our act together, if it goes up in the next ooh, 24, 48 hours, we might even announce it next Monday. Probably going to be a YouTube or Facebook sweepstake of some sort. So keep your eyes on MMOBuff.tv. And as Suda was saying, go and take a look at youtube.com forward slash MMOBuff. Yes. And, and yes, Jaradar, I did mean that. Left out of the competition. But I'm bum ching. And we will be forced to leave you with that joke. <laughs>